Good afternoon, everyone. Let us start. So, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Kaitaro Takahashi, who is visiting us for some time, mostly for our busy week. And he and his students, as you know, are integral part of Indo-Japanese collaboration, Indian Pulse Timing Array. So, Kaitaro is one of the all-rounder in the field of astrophysics and cosmology because he worked on many things, including AGNs, pulsar, pulsar timing, two cosmology, like you see, epoch of reionization and 20 centimeter cosmology. So it is our pleasure to have you today. So thank you for coming from Japan to here. So today he will tell us about how can I probe the, uh, the first stars and re epoch of reionization uh, using the 21 centimeter line. So please, to you. Uh, thank you very much for introducing me. So, uh, I'm Keitaro Takashi from Kumamoto University, Japan. So this is my first time to visit India, so I'm very excited to be here. And so today I will be talking about th this topic, first stars, so which are stars uh, which, which were formed f for the first time in the, in the history of the universe. And then they emit many, uh, uh, many, many photons, like high energy photons like UV or X-rays, and they changed the physical state of the universe. So this is called the epoch of reionization. And they are the, I think, the, uh, uh, the, the, the mystery of the current cosmology. So this, this can be probed by 21 centimeter line. So this is the outline of the, my talk. And I assume uh, most of you are not familiar with cosmology, so I will give, uh, I, I'm trying to give a, a basic uh, review of the cosmology and the epoch of reionization. So re let me start with uh, a brief history of the universe. So this figure represents the history of the universe. The leftmost side is the beginning of the universe, which is called Big Bang. And this is the current universe. The history of the universe is about uh, 13 billion years. And the beginning of the universe is called the Big Bang. So this is uh, like a fireball. And the universe was uh, high density, high temperature. And it is a mixed soup of elementary particles. So there's no uh, atoms or nuclei. And uh, after that, the universe uh, expands and it cools. And sometime after the Big Bang, like 0 0.0001 second after the Big Bang, the temperature gets low, like 10 to the uh, 13 Kelvin. Uh, at this epoch, uh, protons and the neutrons are formed from uh, three quarks. So before this, uh, before this epoch, uh, the temperature was so high that these nuclei cannot be formed, so they are easily destroyed by the photons. And at about three minutes after the Big Bang, temperature get, get like uh, 10, to, 10 to 9 Kelvin. So and the, the synthesis of the lighter elements, like for helium, uh, occurred. So this is called the Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And then about uh, the age of uh, 400,000 years, uh, which is equal to the redshift 1100, the temperature is like 3,000 Kelvin. And in this epoch, uh, a proton and electron uh, become, uh, get together to form a hydrogen atom. And so, uh, from this epoch, there is less interaction between matter and uh, radiation. So radiation can go f freely. Uh, and, and we observe this radiation as a cosmic microwave background. So this is, is the, uh, the generation of the cosmic microwave background. And after the recombination of the hydrogen atoms, uh, the, uh, this period is called dark age. So because the temperature is too low, so below uh, 1000 Kelvin, so there's no optical light. And further, there's no astronomical objects like stars and galaxies. So actually, uh, there is no vis visible light at this epoch. So this is called dark age. 
And at a certain epoch, uh, uh, at a certain uh, uh, era, uh, first stars, uh, stars are formed for the first time in the universe. And we don't know much about these first stars, how they formed, what they are like, and when they are formed, we do not know much about this. But sometime after the Big Bang, first stars are, are formed. And these are called POP3 stars, and it has no uh, heavy, heavy elements like uh, heavier than the helium. And this is primordial stars. And then, uh, first galaxies are also formed, and it is expected that first stars are much heavier than the current uh, stars, like Sun. So they can, uh, they can form black holes. And the first black holes uh, were for, uh, must, be, must be formed at this epoch also. And the uh, approximate uh, age of the universe, of the cosmic dawn, is expected to be like 0.1 giga year. So this is theoretical expectation. And this, is cor this corresponds to the redshift 30 or something. But we are not sure about this uh, age. And then, the first stars on the first galaxies or first black holes uh, emit a lot of photons, like UV or X-rays, uh, high energy photons. And they can uh, ionize the intergalactic hydrogen. So, so remember, so, so you remember, at the beginning of the universe, the universe was very hot, and all matter were uh, deformed into elementary particles. And then hydrogen atoms are formed, and, and again, hydrogen atoms are ionized. So this is called the epoch of reionization. And the corresponding age is like uh, one giga year, and the redshift is like uh, six or something. Then 10 giga year, so redshift 0.5. So dark energy appears uh, at this epoch, and the sun and the earth uh, are formed. And finally, the current uni universe is like 13.8 uh, giga year. So today's topic is uh, this epoch, from the dark age, cosmic dawn, and the epoch of reionization. So almost the beginning of the universe. Okay, so let me focus on the epoch of reionization. So this is the schematic view of the structure formation of the universe. So in the beginning, uh, so there was a period called inflation. So in, during the inflation, a tiny fluctuation in the energy were generated from the quantum fluctuations. And the density fluctuation then uh, evolved due to the gravity. So in the beginning, the fluctuation was very, very tiny, like 10 to the minus 5 or something. And then due to the gravity, uh, dense region become more dense. So uh, in the end, uh, like this and like this, galaxies or uh, stars are formed in the densest region. So this is the uh, structure formation. So this is the simulation of the uh, first star formation and the epoch of reionization. So this is redshift 24. Uh, you can see a blue uh, box. And blue color represents a neutral hydrogen and not ionized. And at the redshift 6, this is almost yellow. And the yellow means the ionized hydrogen. So at redshift 24, uh, the almost all hydrogens were uh, neutral, not ionized. And then, after the formation of first galaxies, they ionize hydrogen uh, around, around it. And you, you can see a yellow bubble. So this is an ionized bubble so around, the, around the galaxy. Uh, and in the universe, there are uh, a lot of galaxies were formed. And these ionized bubbles uh, extend and connect to each other. And then the whole universe was ionized. So this is the completion of the reionization. So physical process of the 
for fast start generation for and uh, epoch of real radiation is like this. So at the beginning, there was uh, a tiny density fluctuation, like 10 to the minus 5 or something. And then it is so tiny, and that's the evolution is uh, linear, linear. And then at some time, uh, when the density fluctuation becomes large, like 0.1 or something, the evolution becomes nonlinear. And finally, it, the dense region uh, were formed into uh, an object called halo, halo. A halo consists of dark matter and baryons, uh, uh, normal matter. And then baryon gas uh, cooled and, and formed first stars. And as I said before, uh, we don't know much about the first stars, how they are formed, what they are like. And there are a lot of simulations uh, to, to study first stars. So, and it is generally expected that first stars are very massive compared to the current stars. So, this is the two examples of the uh, initial mass function of first stars. And this is the one simulation, and uh, the horizontal axis is the mass, and this is one solar mass, 10 solar mass, 100 solar mass. And the mass function is like this. So, the peak is like uh, tens of solar masses. So it's much larger, m massive than the current uh, stars. And this is another simulation. Uh, 10 solar mass, 100 solar mass, 1,000 solar mass. And the peak is like 100 solar mass. So anyway, the, we can expect first stars are much, much heavier than the current uh, stars. So this is because uh, there's no metal, he heavy elements in the, in the beginning of the universe. So the, the cooling of the gas is very uh, less effective compared, compared to the, uh, the current uh, gas. So, so the star must be much larger than the, uh, the current universe to cool. And, and the simulations so, so predict a much higher, a much heavier star for the stars. And then, as I said, so these heavy stars will form a black hole. So the first black holes were formed at this epoch too. So as I said, first star uh, pro produce first black holes. And the first star explodes as a supernova explosion. And then uh, from the feedback of the explosion, the next generation stars called the POP2 uh, stars were generated. And this uh, would be much uh, lighter than the first stars because the gas has uh, metal heavy elements. And these objects, uh, first stars, POP2 stars, and the first black holes uh, emit a lot of photons, UV or X-rays, and they, they can all uh, contribute to the epoch of reionization. So they can uh, reionize the intergalactic medium. But we don't know which is the main contributor of the epoch of reionization. This is one of the uh, biggest questions about the epoch of reionization. And there are many probes to study these epochs. So and in this talk, I will focus on 21 centimeter line. Here. Okay. Uh, let me review briefly the conventional method to uh, probe a book of reionization. And there are two conventional ways. And one is the CMB, especially the large scale E mode polarization of CMB. And this is a map of the uh, cosmic micro microwave background. The color represents the temperature. And you can kind of see this uh, white line, white curve, uh, which represents the polarization plane of the cosmic microwave background. And from the pattern of the, uh, this polarization, uh, we, can, uh, we can get the uh, optical depth of the cosmic microwave background photons. The, so CMB photons are, can be scattered by the uh, free 
electrons. So the, from the, uh, the optical depth of the cosmic microwave background photons, so we can know the, the, the amount of free electrons from the uh, CMB production to the observer. So the, from the observation, the, the optical depth is like 0.1, so which means that about 10% of the CMB photons were scattered during the, their way from the production to the Earth. And from this, uh, we can evaluate the, the, the electron density in the intergalactic medium. And if we assume the instantaneous reionization, re the reionization occurred at about 10 or something. So this is a very rough uh, estimation of the, the epoch of reionization. And Gunn Peterson test is another probe of the epoch of reionization. So, so, so this can probe uh, the intergalactic matter ionization, ionization rate from H1 absorption. So this is the uh, spectrum of a quasar at a higher redshift, like uh, redshift six or seven or something. And from this uh, spectrum, uh, we can know the, the density of the neutral hydrogen. And from this, uh, we know that reorganization was completed at redshift six or something. So these, uh, these numbers are representative number of epoch reorganization. So these are what we know and what we don't know about the epoch reorganization. And what we know is the reionization re proceeded around redshift 10, and it was completed at redshift 6. And the residual neutral fraction is about 10 to the minus 4. Not all the neutral hydrogen were uh, ionized, and this is, uh, there is a tiny residual neutral fraction. And th this is uh, all what we know currently. And these are what we don't know. So, the, what, what kind of objects contributed to the reionization? So as I said, so POP3, POP2, or AGN, or black holes can all uh, contribute to the epoch of reionization, but we don't know the main contributor. So black hole may be the main contributor, or POP3, or POP2. And we know the, the completion uh, the epoch of completion of ionization, uh, redshift six, but we don't know the time evolution of the ionization fraction. And we want to know when first stars formed and how they were massive. And we also want to know first black holes and how, how heavy they are and when they are formed. So these are what we want to know, we don't know. And to study these things, uh, the, one of the very powerful tools is the 21 centimeter line. So what is 21 centimeter line? So this is physically the hyperfine structure of the uh, hydrogen atom. So this is the hydrogen atom, so which consists of a proton and an electron. And so they have both spin, spin uh, one half. And if the spin is uh, parallel, so this state is, has a slightly larger energy than the anti-parallel state. The energy difference between these corresponds to the 21 centimeter line. The frequency is like uh, 1.4 gigahertz. So with this 21 centimeter line, we can probe a neutral hydrogen. So the neutral hydrogen can emit or absorb 21 centimeter line, but ionized hydrogen cannot. So from this 21 centimeter line, we can uh, probe the neutral hydrogen, okay? And actually, uh, we don't observe 21 centimeter line as, as they were. So due to the cosmological expansion, so for example, uh, uh, 21 centimeter line emitted at redshift six, uh, uh, redshifted to about 200 megahertz. 
and, and uh, redshift 20 corresponds to 70 megahertz. So these are the target uh, frequency of the epoch of reanalyzation 21 centimeter line. So with this very low frequency radio waves, like 100 megahertz, we can observe uh, cosmic dome and epoch of reanalyzation tomographically. So because this is a line, so we can know tomographically. So here, let me introduce a very important quantity, uh, which is related to the 21 centimeter radiation. So it's called spin temperature. And the spin temperature is defined like this. This is spin temperature. And this is the number density of the anti-parallel state, a ground state. So this is the uh, number density of the parallel, so excited state. And this is the ground state. So the ratio can be expressed as a Boltzmann uh, distribution. And this is the uh, spin temperature. So essentially, the spin temperature uh, represents the, the ratio, abundance ratio between ground and excited states. And you must remember that in the universe, there were uh, always uh, cosmic wave CMB photons. So we have always a radio wave in the universe. So what we observe is the, uh, the absorption of the CMB or emission of the uh, 21 centimeter beside the CMB photons. So they offset from the CMB, okay? So this is the C CMB and we observe this CMB radiation, but uh, uh, in between uh, there must be some H1 clouds. And if this cloud has a lower temperature than the CAB temperature, CAB photons were absorbed into this cloud. So we observe less photons expected from the CMB radiation. On the other hand, if the cloud is, uh, has a higher temperature, higher spin temperature than the CMB temperature, we observe uh, more photons expect, uh, than expected from the CMB radiation. So, so we observe the difference between the uh, spin temperature and the CMB temperature. So, so how the spin temperature is determined? So there are three processes which, which affect the spin temperature. And one is the interaction between the CMB photons and the neutral hydrogen atoms. And with this interaction, the spin temperature is uh, approaches to the CMB temperature, TCMB. The second interaction is, the second process is the atomic collision. So this couples the kinetic temperature of the gas with the spin temperature. So the gas uh, kinetic temperature and the spin temperature is a different temperature, okay? And the efficiency is uh, represented like Xc. And the final process is the interaction with ambient Riemann alpha photons. So interaction between the hydrogen atoms and the Riemann alpha photons. And this couples the uh, color temperature, uh, which is defined by the spectrum of the ambient Riemann alpha uh, spectrum. So uh, the spin temperature is affected by these three temperatures, CMB temperature, uh, kinetic gas temperature and the color temperature. And physically, these two temperatures are almost in equilibrium. So they can be uh, assumed to be the same. So uh, spin temperature is affected by these two uh, temperatures. And this figure represents the expected evolution of the spin temperature. So, but before that, I let me explain the uh, CMB temperature, the behavior of CMB temperature and the uh, gas kinetic temperature. So this is the redshift. Uh, this is a higher redshift and the lower redshift. And this is temperature. And this blue line represents the CMB temperature. And the CMB temperature behavior is uh, very simple. It just uh, cool down with the expansion as uh, inverse A, scale factor, so just like uh, this. 
and then gas kinetic temperature. So it also cools with expansion, cosmological expansion. But because this is a non-relativistic fluid, uh, this cools down like uh, a minus two inverse a squared. So this cools much faster than the radiation. But at some time, uh, the gas can be heated by the formation of galaxies or stars. So they emit high energy uh, radiation and the intergalactic gas can be heated. So, uh, so it, it rises like this when the uh, stars and the galaxies are formed. So this green line. So first they cool down and at some time at the formation of the galaxies, they are heated like this, okay? So these are CMB temperature and gas temperature. So let me go back to the spin temperature. The spin temperature, the evolution of the spin temperature is represented as this red a complicated line. So actually this uh, behaves very complicated. So, uh, so as I said, the spin temperature is affected by both CMB temperature and gas kinetic temperature. And sometimes uh, the spin temperature approaches to the gas temperature, and sometimes it approaches to the CMB temperature. So it is determined by the efficiency of the uh, interaction between hydrogen atoms and the CMB or uh, other thing. And in, uh, in a typical model of the cosmology, the evolution of spin temperature will be like this. So first, they approach it to the gas temperature, and then after uh, some ex expansion of the universe, the, uh, the atomic collision uh, becomes less frequent so due to the deletion of the hydrogen atoms. So the spin temperature approaches to the CMB temperature. And at some time after this, so like redshift 30 or something, the, the Lyman alpha, photo, Lyman alpha photons were uh, emitted by first stars or first galaxies or first black holes. And at this epoch, uh, they again approach it to the gas temperature. And then the spin temperature rises with the gas, spin temperature, gas temperature. So in a typical model, the spin temperature behaves like this. It is very complicated. And this, the former half of this evolution is, uh, we, we are confident about this, uh, the evolution of this epoch because this is determined almost, uh, by the, almost all by the cosmo cosmology, which we know very much. But at this epoch, uh, this involves uh, the big uncertainty involved with the astrophysical process like star formation or uh, galaxy formation. So we are not so uh, confident about the, this epoch. So, uh, so uh, we can probe the, this epoch by measuring the spin temperature. So as I said, uh, the observation, uh, the observational quantity is the difference uh, between the spin temperature and the CMB temperature. So, so this is the CMB temperature, and this is the spin temperature, and the observable quantity, the difference between these two temperatures. And that is called the uh, brightness temperature. And this is the, the expected spectrum of the uh, 25 centimeter signal. And this is frequency and the low frequency, which corresponds to higher redshift. So for example, uh, frequency 50 corresponds to redshift 30 or something. And this is a higher uh, frequency, which corresponds to lower redshift. And this is the brightness temperature. And this is zero. So if the spin temperature is exactly the same as the CMB temperature, the uh, brightness temperature is zero. But there must be some difference between the spin temperature and the CMB temperature. So this is the difference. So this is the observable quantity. 
So as we saw, uh, in the first half of this evolution, the spin temperature is lower than the CMB temperature. So in this epoch, the signal is absorption. So that corresponds to this epoch, so below zero, so which means the absorption. And after, uh, after that, the signal becomes emission like this. So this is because the spin temperature goes up like this. So this is emission compared to the CMB. Okay, so this is the expected signal. And from this spectrum, uh, we can probe the epoch of reionization, uh, uh, which is a low rate shift in this, in this figure, and cosmic dome and dark ages. But unfortunately, uh, so look at the frequency here. So from the, the surface of the Earth, uh, there, there is a lower bound uh, which we can observe, uh, the lower, bound, lower bounds on the frequency uh, which we can observe. So below 50 megahertz or 30 megahertz, the, the ionosphere can reflect the uh, cosmic radio wave. So we cannot observe uh, these low frequency uh, range. So we cannot observe or probe dark ages from the Earth. So we must wait for uh, uh, something like a lunar telescope or like that. So from the Earth, we can uh, observe these epochs, cosmic dome and epoch of reionization. So I don't really explain so much about the uh, specific models of the epoch of reionization. But I just want to show the variation of the models and the uh, corresponding signals. So, so, so for example, we, uh, one of the uh, parameters of the model, epoch of reionization model, is the X-ray intensity of the uh, galaxies or black holes. So X-rays can hit the IgM gas, and the source could be a quasar or X-ray binary or supernova or something. And uh, the emissivity of the X-ray uh, depends on the initial mass function, a binary fraction, or something like that. And if we, if we vary the uh, X-ray intensity of the object, the signal changes like this. Uh, this black. This black line is the fiducia model, but we, if we increase the X-ray intensity like 100 times, it becomes like this, this blue one. So because X-ray can hit the IgM, so there's no absorption. So it, they uh, hit the IgM very quickly. So the similar example is this. So if we vary the intensity of Lyman alpha, the signal changes accordingly, like this. So from the observation of this spectrum, we can know the intensity of X-rays or Lyman alpha of the, the galaxies at this epoch. Sorry, just one question. Mm -hmm. So is it by changing the new Hydrogen that these things are modified. Is that how this goes? Uh, so they they change the spin temperature. Okay. So because they uh, so for example, X-ray can heat the the intergalactic medium. But the neutral hydrogen fraction remains the same. Yeah, so it depends on the epoch. So actually, so at this epoch, the neutral hydrogen gets more uh, ionized. So uh, the signal can, can be reduced. But at this epoch, uh, the hydrogens are almost uh, neutral. So before the redshift uh, 20 or something. So X-ray uh, can affect the signal through the spin temperature.
Okay, so now we want to uh, think about the fluctuation of the 21 centimeter line. So actually what we considered uh, so far is the average spin temperature of the universe. But there must be some fluctuation, uh, spatial fluctuation of the spin temperature and the brightness temperature. So the brightness temperature fluctuation is expressed like, like this. So it depends on the uh, ionization fraction at the position and baryon density, uh, baryon over density, uh, so baryon density fluctuation, and the spin temperature, which also depends on the spatial position, and the peculiar velocity. So uh, these four quantities affect the uh, observable uh, brightness temperature. So if we uh, perform a very idealized observation, we will get uh, an images like this, like this. So you remember that we, so we can observe the neutral hydrogen. So the epoch before the reionization can emit a lot of 21 centimeter line. So we, the image is like this. So after the reionization, there's no uh, neutral hydrogen. So there's no signal like this. So when the reionization begins, the, there must be uh, ionized bubbles like this. So these are the fluctuation of the 21 centimeter uh, line. So and if you, uh, if we can get the images like this, so and we can find the ionizing bubble like this, so there must be a source of the ionizing photons here. So 21 centimeter line cannot observe the source itself. So uh, we need uh, uh, the multi-wavelength observation, like optical or uh, sub-millimeter. So if, if we observe here with the JWST or ALMA or something, so we can uh, observe the source of the, this ionized bubble. So uh, there are two ways to uh, observe the epoch of reionization with 21 centimeter lines. So one is the uh, average temperature, uh, which is called the global signal. So this is the average temperature of the universe. Uh, so we, what we obtain is like this, like this. And from this, we can know the evolution of spin temperature. And more interesting is the fluctuation of the 21 centimeter line. So from the fluctuation, uh, we can get the images like this, or uh, if the signal to noise is not so good, uh, we can measure the statistics of the fluctuation, like power spectrum or something. So, uh, so first we will be able to measure the statistics of the signal, and then if we have uh, enough sensitivity, like SKA, so we will be able to do imaging of this epoch. So this is the uh, theoretical uh, expected evolution of power spectrum, so which, may, which quantifies the fluctuation of the uh, 25 centimeter signal. And uh, uh, this is the redshift, so high, higher redshift and lower redshift. And there are a lot of uh, models. And uh, these are a pass, the evolution of the power spectrum. And uh, so the evolution of the signal re reflect the physical processes which affect the H1. And they are dependent on the uh, model parameters. And in this figure, several models are, are shown. So for example, um, so look at this blue line. So the rise is here, and there are some peaks. So one, two, three peaks. So these peaks reflect the uh, physical processes, uh, like the interaction between the uh, Lyman alpha and hydrogen or something. And so, so the signal, the evolution of the signal, are uh, highly dependent on the parameters of the models, like this and like this. 
And on the other hand, uh, the sensitivity of the telescopes like MWA, HERA, and the next generation SKA are also shown here. So this is the sensitivity of the MWA uh, located in the Australia. So uh, this telescope can measure the uh, 20 watt centimeter signal of low redshift, like redshift 10 or something. And uh, one of the next generation is the HERA, located at South Africa. So this is now being constructed and beginning to uh, do the observation. So this has a much higher sensitivity like this. So the observation will extend to the redshift like 20 or something. And this is the sensitivity of the SKA. So this has a much uh, higher sensitivity than HERA and MWA. So this will extend to redshift like 25 or something. So this is exactly the redshift of the cosmic dome. So with the current telescopes like MWA, uh, we can probe the epoch of ion radiation, relatively low redshift like uh, 10 or something. And with the SKA, we can, uh, we can study much higher redshift, like 20 or 25, uh, which corresponds to the uh, cosmic dome, first star formation. And let me show you some of uh, the studies of our groups. And actually, so this is the power spectrum of the fluctuation. So in cosmology, uh, we measure fluctuations with the power spectrum. And this is enough, power spectrum is enough uh, if the fluctuation is Gaussian statistically. But actually, in fact, the signal of 21 centimeter line is highly non-Gaussian, not Gaussian at all. So power spectrum is not enough. So we can, uh, we can get more information with the higher order statistics like a bispectrum or a Minkowski functional. So we calculated these higher statistics to extract more information from the observation. Uh, this is an example of the calculation of the bispectrum. Uh, so, and so this is the expected constraint on the model parameters. So this is one per model parameter which represents the emission efficiency of the UV photon. And this is a parameter which re represents the mean free path of the radiation. And this a green circle represents the constraint, expected constraint from the measurement of the power spectrum. And on the other hand, from the bias spectrum, the constraint will become much tighter than the power spectrum, like this. So we can add information from the measurement of the bias spectrum. And this is an example of the Minkowski functional. So Minkowski functional is a, uh, a bit uh, a difficult quantity and which which measures the shape of the map. So this is the uh, 21 centimeter signal map, and we can quantify the, the shape of the, these bubbles or fluctuation somehow. And we, we, can, uh, uh, we can show the, the, this shape like this as a function and a function. So from these, uh, quantities like bias spectrum or mixed key functional, we can get more information which cannot be uh, obtained by the conventional power spectrum. So this is our approach. Sorry, uh, so is it possible to say what is the source of this non-Gaussianity? I mean, what is Source that? of the yeah. non-Gaussianity? Is that yeah. due to some interaction or what is that? Yeah, the one simple reason is that's so if there is a source here, so it can make a bubble. So this is very non-Gaussian object. So in, in this region, the fluctuation is uh, similar to Gaussian fluctuation. But if there are some bubbles, that makes a very large non-Gaussianity. Non 
So the reionization is the reason for the non-Gaussian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there is yeah. no reionization, then it would be uh, Gaussian. Is that uh, not exactly? But uh, uh, but but uh, reionization is the big source of the non-Gaussian. Okay, so 21 centimeter line for the study of dark wave, cosmic tone, and epoch of re addition. And this is a new probe of uh, these epochs. Uh, and this is the 21 centimeter line comes from the hyper fine structure of the hydrogen and can directly probe the intergalactic medium. And this is actually the measurement of spin temperature compared to the CMB temperature. And the observation can be done with the global signal, which is the average temperature of the universe, and the fluctuations. And uh, as you saw, the cosmic dawn and the epoch of reionization are very complicated mixture of cosmology and astrophysics. So cosmologists and astrophysicists must uh, work together uh, to, to study this epoch. So finally, uh, I will explain about the current status of the observation of 21 centimeter line. So first of all, so one group has uh, claimed the detection of the global signal, so which is the average temperature of the universe. So the group uh, has performed the experiment called EDGES, and it's about five years ago. And they claimed that the detection of absorption of the global signal at uh, 70 to 80 megahertz, which corresponds to redshift 15 and 20. So this corresponds to the uh, epoch of cosmic dawn. So that was very uh, exciting, if that is true. So, so this is um, one experiment. So this must be confirmed by other experiments. So now, uh, many, many experiments are doing the uh, similar analysis and observation. So this must be confirmed. And this is a, a global signal. And on the other hand, uh, the fluctuation of the uh, 21 centimeter line has, not, has never been detected yet. But several experiments, several telescopes are now trying to detect the fluctuation of the 21 centimeter line. So these are the, uh, the telescopes now ongoing. So MWA at, in Australia, and LOFA in Europe, and HERA uh, in South Africa. And they are doing very hard uh, and analysis and observation, but the signal has never been detected yet. And the largest obstacle to detect the 21 centimeter line is the huge foreground. So the foreground is the uh, radiation between the uh, signal and the observer. So the signal comes from the redshift 6 or 10 or 20. It's, it's very far from the observer. And the, in front of that, there, there are uh, many, many galaxies and uh, Milky Way uh, radiation object. So these are uh, foregrounds. And typically, the signal of the EOR 21 centimeter line is 5 mil Kelvin. Mil Kelvin. And uh, on the other hand, the foregrounds. So for example, uh, galactic foregrounds, which consists of synchrotron and, and free free radiation is typically five Kelvin. So this is much, much higher than the, uh, what we want. So like a thousand times the expected signal. So this is a huge foreground. And also uh, there must be some extra galactic foregrounds, uh, typically like uh, one Kelvin or something. So this is the biggest obstacle to detect the signal. So the signal would be redshifted. Yeah. So then how yeah. is the foreground uh, a background for this thing? Hmm? Sorry? How is this a background? I mean, couldn't it be separated by just redshift? So th these emissions are continuum. continuum. So, and so, so it falls in that window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's not a line feature, is it? They are, they are, they are not line, but hydrogen signal is a line. The ref, ref shifted okay. to 100 megahertz or something. And these are continuum, which extend from low frequency to high frequency. So this is a very famous uh, map, uh, Hasla map, at 400 megahertz. And this is a galactic plane. And this is very, very bright. So as I said, so this is typically uh, one Kelvin or 10 Kelvin or something. So the so foregrounds are much larger than the signal by three orders, three orders. And if we, we count, count it in the power spectrum, uh, it's six orders larger than the expected signal. So we must mitigate the foreground somehow. And one good point is the, the spectral feature is very different from the signal, 25 centimeter signal, and foregrounds. And in general, foregrounds are very, has small, uh, smooth spectra, like power law, so like this, while EOR signal has non-smooth spectrum. So this reflects the distribution of the H1 cloud. So it's not smooth, but rather so like this. So this is a cartoon of the, uh, the, the detected signal. So this is the combination of EOR signal and the foreground. So foreground is like this, and the signal is like this. So if we can remove the smooth component of the, the observed spectrum, so we can extract this uh, EOR signal. But it's not easy because the, the smooth foreground is 1,000 times higher than the expected signal. So, uh, there, so far, there, ha, there are three strategies to mitigate the, the foreground. And I don't uh, explain much about that. But so there are three major strategies. The one is subtract the foreground. The second is avo to avoid by going to the Fourier domain. And finally, cross-correlate with other probe, like galaxies or something. So when you say it is smooth, how smooth is it? I mean, it like, is there? Sorry? When you say it is smooth, yeah. how smooth is it? How smooth? That's a very uh, good question. Uh, but typically, it has a power low spectrum. But because the expected signal is 1,000 times smaller than the foreground, so the foreground must be smooth by that level. And we are not sure how smooth they are, actually. But we, we hope uh, they are uh, very smooth at that level. And this is the current status of the uh, observation of the uh, signal fluctuation. So this is the red shift and the lower red shift, like six, and the higher red shift, 20. And these are expected signal, theoretical uh, power spectrum. Uh, it's typically like 10, 10 mil Kelvin or something, below 10, kel 10 mil Kelvin. And these are the uh, current upper bounds on the power spectrum at each redshift. And so, currently, the upper bounds are much larger than the expected signal, the typical signal. So like two orders in power spectrum. So actually, but it, it's, it's getting better and better because originally the foreground is uh, six, uh, larger than the signal by six orders in power spectrum. So originally the foreground is like this. And now we subtract the foreground to this, to this level. And another two uh, orders, okay? And this is uh, the prediction of one extreme model. So we, we are now beginning to uh, 
constrain some extreme models, but not the uh, typical models, not yet. So this is the current situation. So the edges that you showed that is not in the plot. So edges is uh, the global signal, so it, it cannot be put here. These arrows are, uh, is it telling uh, they were done this uh, experiment in all the frequency because the redshift is, uh, span is, hmm? that red, redshift span is telling the different frequencies, right? Uh, what yeah, am I? Yeah, different. Uh, are they different done frequency. in the yeah, different yeah. frequency in the? So, so, so lower frequency here. And ah, yeah, higher frequency here. that one. Yeah, yeah. So that observation done in all the frequencies you are telling. Because you are mentioning all the papers there, is it? Those arrows. arrows are they mentioning observation in all the frequencies like different different frequencies uh, uh, different groups different groups so different groups different groups are uh, shown with different colors power in that redshift which means they are they done the observation that that frequencies hmm. yeah yeah so it's okay it's a span of uh, Multiple. So, so this is like uh, 100 megahertz. Yeah, and this is like um, 80, 80 megahertz. 80, 100 yeah. megahertz. Yeah. So this is the That's future prospect. Just one more. Ah, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. The edges experiment. Uh, those uh, arrows on the top. They are dating back prior. prior Previous to their experimental results, or those numbers uh, come post. Hmm? So, in timeline, uh, the edges experiment are 2018, I think, right? The arrows above the same redshift range, 15 to 20. 15 to 20, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, redshift number 15 to 20, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, those upper limits have been uh, have come out. Before the experiment or after the experiment? I think. Uh, experiment of edges? You mean? Ah, before the edges results. Uh, I think. Uh, I think after the edges experiment. So, so generally, uh, uh, lower uh, lower frequency observation is much tough, tougher, so difficult to analyze. So uh, there was n no motivation before this experiment. But after this experiment, uh, I, I guess uh, there is uh, much motivation they have, and they they obtained these upper bounds. I guess. Okay. Okay. So this is the future prospects of this field, and now uh, some experiments like MWA or HERA or LOFA are now ongoing, and they are. Uh, they can be called the uh, SK0. Actually, they are uh, pathfinders or precursors of the SKA. And I guess uh, yeah, within several years, they may uh, detect the, uh, the signal, the first detection. So the first detection will occur within a few years, I, I, I expect. But after that, SKA1 uh, will appear. And it will, it will do the precise measurement of the power spectrum. And in the era of SK2, uh, it has uh, enough sensitivity to do the imaging of the signal. And to prove the dark wave, so below the 30 megahertz or something, so we need a lunar telescope or something. So this is uh, the future prospect. Okay, so let me summarize. So I talked about the, uh, the frontier in the cosmology. So dark age, cosmic dawn, and epoch pre-orientation. And so we want to know about the first stars, first galaxy, and the, and the first black holes. That so far, these epochs are probed by CMB E mode or Lyman Alpha Forest. And we will uh, soon have a new probe of 21 centimeter line. And the observation is uh, very difficult 
and the analysis is, is also difficult because the signal is very tiny and we, we have a huge uh, foreground. And now ongoing uh, telescope will uh, do the first detection within a few years, I guess. And in the latter half of the 2020s, uh, we will have the SKA, and which will open a new era of the study of the cosmic dawn and the epoch reorientation. So thank you very much for, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Keitaros, for such an interesting talk. So, questions? Yeah. Uh, so, how the cross correlation techniques with the other probe is helping you to uh, reduce the foreground? Uh -huh. So, so it's one way of the foreground mitigation. So, so for example, so if we subtract. Uh, the very smooth component of this foreground, and we get this. So even if we get this, we are not sure uh, if we we ex we uh, sub we subtracted the foreground completely, or well, there must be some residual in here. So to uh, to be confident, we have the right subtraction or right signal. We can cross correlate the signal with the uh, other probe like galaxies. So, as we saw, okay, this image. So, this is the ionized bubble. So, there must be some sources here, 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 here. So, if we, this is the correct signal. And, and when we cross correlate with the distribution of galaxies with the 21 centimeter signal map, there must be a negative correlation. So, uh, so in, in this way, we can be confident in the subtraction of the background. Yeah, uh, distribution of the galaxy, yeah, cross, cross correlating distribution of the galaxy yeah. with the foreground subtracted uh, yeah. signal. Yeah, foreground subtract, subtracted map with the uh, galaxy map. But that's not, uh, the, the galaxy map is not the continuous thing, right? Then how? how ah, so, like, uh, so, so we, we must know the redshift of the galaxies. So higher redshift galaxies like uh, redshift 6 or something. And we can correlate with the high, higher redshift galaxies with known redshift. Okay, so we, we must observe the galaxies with uh, emission line or something, like Lyman Alpha. Okay, uh, another question. So, so the power spectrum you are uh, showing, which scale does it correspond to? Uh, so typically, the scale is uh, 0.1 uh, inverse megaparsec. And why this scale is important? Uh, so it, it almost corresponds to the scale of the ionized bubble. So this scale is like um, uh, 10 megaparsec or something. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so uh, last year, uh, wasn't there a kind of a dispute where the Saras 3 experiment was uh -huh. disputing the edges claim? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't exactly understand the science behind it. Could you explain what was the Saras 3 group's uh -huh. claim that the edges did not detect um, yeah. the signal? So I don't have uh, the figures, but uh, as I said, so the edges experiment claimed the detection of absorption feature. So like. So this is the expected uh, global signal, and the edges experiment claimed the detection of this absorption feature. And uh, last year, the Salas ex experiment, so so which is led by Indian group, I guess, uh, rejected the this, the presence of this signal. Okay, so so there, there was a dispute. But actually, the edges result is much uh, deeper absorption like this. 
So it's like uh, five times uh, larger, deeper than the expected signal. So theoretically, it is very unnatural. And the Saras ex experiment rejected such a deep absorption feature. Okay, so then to just thank Kitaro again. Thank you very much.